Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anthony Gampel. I am a PhD candidate from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, my research looks at uh, video games as tools to foster participation in learning about disaster. Okay, so we have a few uh, examples here uh, that we'll go through as we uh, go through the presentation. Uh, just a quick hands up. Who plays games? Candy Crush. Anyone plays Candy Crush? You will play games. Solitaire. So what this quick uh, show of hands demonstrated was that gamers are no longer those teenage boys sitting in their um, rooms. We've got all different age groups. Elderly, uh, not, we're well, not elderly, but senior, uh, middle-aged, uh, and of course uh, young people. Okay, so video games can actually reach a, a larger uh, amount of people. So what my research uh, looks into uh, in my honours dissertation is that what we uh, looked at in the beginning was how we can classify these games. Okay, so disaster, uh, serious disaster games, such as the Stop Disasters, uh, earthquake response, uh, how we can classify these against the DRR framework. Okay, so that looked at prevention, mitigation, preparedness, ticked the content off, also looked at discourses. But what we also did was look at mainstream games, SimCity, uh, and all these other sorts of games, um, which basically showed us that actually we can get the same information from mainstream games as we can from serious games. The key difference between serious games and um, also uh, edgy, uh, mainstream games is the fact that actually mainstream games are more fun. No one likes to be told how to learn. Yet these sorts of games tell us this is what you should be doing. Stop Disasters, you and ISDR game. Fantastic example. Here we are being told, well, having the concepts do this for prevention, uh, you know, mitigation, etc. But what actually happened was YouTube demonstrated that players were actually playing this the wrong way. How can we kill the most people? So we're not saving people, we're killing people. The key point here is they're actually learning in a very different way. They've turned it around and going, okay, we're gonna build our buildings on the beach. We're gonna build our buildings close, no protection. Yet when you ask them, why have you done this? Or what would you do to uh, save lives? They say, well, don't build on the beach because that's how you're gonna kill the most people. So they're actually showing a very different um, concept. We've got God simulations in terms of mainstream games. Here we're playing with the uh, sort of the environment and of course, this one here uh, highlights a bit of traditional knowledge that actually the, uh, the villagers have barriers that they can actually uh, defend against uh, different hazards. Um, but of course, these are all really good examples that in terms of mainstream is that players can actually experiment. We can play. We're not being told what to do. We can do whatever we want. And in which case, we're then learning very differently, okay? So they're being able to make self-regulate their choices, their experiences, and what we can do. This example here is from Assassin's Creed. Uh, this is Black Flag. This is another mainstream uh, action game. And as we can see, the popular culture sort of aspects of disaster myth, uh, we can see these sorts of concepts around uh, the, the, the extreme disaster uh, hazard event, extreme earthquake, extreme destruction. We can see people panicking which we know from looking at CCTV footage, like from Christchurch earthquake, that these things actually don't occur. People are more rational, there's no irrational behavior. The key point for this video actually is what the point is at the end. And the end of this video shows us uh, the whole concept around uh, that God is the reason for uh, hazards that are out of our control. Yet, our main protagonist here, he touched the piece of Eden, which actually set, triggered off the earthquake. However, what we can see in terms of the discourse is that this is almost a, a, uh, a way that we can see that humans, a disaster is only uh, a disaster when a hazard comes in contact to humans, human society. And this is exactly what this is showing. He did it, and his comment is gonna pop up here in a few seconds, he's escaped. He's going to say to us, well, actually, uh, why would God do this to us? And he says, God had nothing to do with this. So it's that whole discourse around the social uh, dimensions of disaster. 
okay? And of course, uh, you know, these are sorts of things that players are, are engaged. We're playing this, we're seeing these, this content as we make it through. We've got games such as uh, the American Red Cross. This is Monster Guard, uh, which is available over here. Um, and of course, it's again, this one's for younger children. It's a serious game. Uh, and of course, we're learning to prepare and we can see these different dimensions uh, of disaster. What, what would you do? I haven't played this one personally. I can't get it in New Zealand, but uh, hopefully we can fix that. Uh, and of course, we can see these sorts of things. We can share, we can learn. Something that I want to bring up, though, uh, is the fact that often these games don't have a long-term trajectory, OK? They're often one-shot projects. This was highlighted in my honors dissertation. They're one-off projects. We slap all this money into it, and yet nothing comes out of it. Do we know they're effective? Yes or no? Often these things don't get tested, which is where my PhD is coming in and testing. And this is something which is important, because these communities of uh, mainstream games actually have a following. People will follow these games. So in which case, we've got already a core group of people. It's popular. People that grow up will keep with the series, and they'll keep moving through. So we can almost put these sorts of concepts within it. It looks like we've had a bit of a pause. That's fine. This one here is Fallout 4. So Fallout 4, obviously, there's about five games in the series. And what Fallout 4 does is focuses on the recovery aspect. This is post-apocalyptic. Um, uh, it doesn't matter where it is, actually. Um, but what we can see here is that we're seeing shelters. People are building shelters. We're building food. We're, we're putting water in. And this is something Im important, because this is a quest that's given to the players that they have to identify what do we need to do. We need to build these sorts of things. And of course, this carries on later on in the game where the players take this knowledge further. Every settlement that they visit might have a different issue. They might need clean water. They've got a shelter. They've got food, but no clean water. So how do we do that? And of course, something that's key after this is that we build these links, trade links. So we're getting the economic situation back up. People have more hope. People are resilient. And instead, we're focusing not on the uh, sort of negative impacts of the disaster. We're not looking at the casualties. We're not looking at the destruction, but rather we're looking at hope. We're looking at rebuilding. We're looking at re recovery, basically, here. So instead, we've got a very different dimension around disaster. And actually, things you know, can, can be uh, happen. Of course, uh, Stop Disasters is a, a, a city simulation. And of course, this is something, uh, this game here is um, City Skylines. It's a new one. It's developed by a, a Swedish uh, developer. And actually, they're using this tool, this game, actually, I should say, as a learning tool, but also as a planning tool. They're modeling their cities using this system. Because the data that we can ha include in here shows all different things. Bushfires we can have in this game. The wind makes a difference. How are our responses there? Where are our facilities? We're replacing things. And this is the, all that's available to the players themselves. Again, unlike Stop Disasters, where we're quite restricted in what we can do, complete access. We can do whatever we want. And this is something key, is that disasters in this game uh, you know, can be occurred by the player. So I want to see how my city uh, uh, um, sort of withstands an earthquake. So I can get that tool and put it down and destroy my city if I wanted to. And I can see how it will respond. How will my services get through uh, in terms of that? So I mean, really, I think the key message, of course, I could talk about this all day, every day. Uh, and I have been doing most of my life, I guess. So of course, any questions are, are after this, if there's further. But I mean, the key message I think I want you guys to take away is that serious games, yes, uh, they've been there. And of course, there's a lot of things, people are getting into it now. But mainstream games, don't, uh, don't disregard them. Don't think that they're something that we can't actually use, because actually the advantages possibly of mainstream games to take disaster messages to a much wider community of all ages, we can put our hazard models into this, as we can see. We can see these sorts of concepts. These could be much more powerful tools. So I think that's really the key message between serious games, mainstream games. How can we use these to better understand uh, and provide 
learning tools for disaster and disaster risk reduction. Okay? And as we can see, this video will play out. Are there any questions so far? Or, I mean, are there any questions? Is it applied to several types of hazards? Yeah, of course. So these games can look at all sorts of things. I didn't use the example, this war is mine. This war is mine actually focuses upon war, but not the usual type of war that we see. We see uh, often the games that we see are American uh, um, soldiers going guns blazing. This war of mine took a very different approach. We're in the, foot, uh, in the shoes of a civilian, a survivor of a war. They can't uh, get out. They can't access different foods. They have to make very uh, sort of choices which could threaten their survival or, or increase it. So people could knock on the door th and they say, hey, we need um, someone to help us um, down the road. That player could be gone for two days and your characters will start feeling the impacts of it, going, hold on, where's he gone? Is he coming back? And they'll have all sorts of different emotional effects. So it's not just linked to natural hazards. We can look at all sorts of other dimensions in these sorts of games. Good question. Any other questions? If you were to create a game and you need the balance, I mean, the great challenge in doing any of these types of things, of the, the balance, like you said at the beginning, of entertainment and also creating issues, reality of making these things, can you just describe a scenario, like a game that you would create and which you would somehow combine that in a way that would be compelling for people to play it and yet also to convey this message in a way that's better done or conveys the, the types of messages that you're saying? So, I mean, one of the ways, uh, of course, these are all sorts of ideas in my head. I mean, one of the ways that you can do it is embed these sorts of things within mainstream games already. So, additional DLC, which is downloadable content, can be put into these games. One way, which you've already then got a database uh, of, of, of participants that will be involved. Another way is, could be something like Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go, that whole concept, taking video games uh, out into the real world, linking it between schools, teachers, and then bringing, the key point there though is bringing the, uh, the video game from school into the household, which then links onto parents getting involved. We saw Pokemon Go, parents got out and, uh, out and about with their kids, got engaged in it, they're playing together, they're communicating. There's all sorts of tools that we can use to bridge these gaps and actually get parents involved, kids involved, teachers involved, and the community at large. Not only just the local community, but wider communities as well, gamers themselves talking between. I think I'm not going to get a gong. I got a gong. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. And um, I think if this video just goes a little bit further, there'll be uh, my details, two to links to two of my papers if you want to learn more. So maybe we can just quicken the video up towards the end. Can we get the video a little bit further? A little bit further. Yep, keep going. Oh, of course, that's Cypher, uh, which was the UNESCO game. And of course, a little bit, yeah, just leave it there. That'll, that'll nearly finish. So of course, this is another video game available on apps uh, for kids um, to play. And of course, we could have, a, this one has a few languages, which is quite a good um, thing. And ready, and pause. There we are, take your photos. Uh, and uh, those are those uh, papers that I have based on my research, and of course my contact details. Thank you.